don't know who you are, so I, I'm going to take a stab at making a few remarks and, and see how it goes. The good news is we have other panelists who are also going to take a stab, and if that doesn't work, we'll ask you to, uh, to scare up some conversation. Um, background. Um, that's kind of a current list of my current jobs. I've spent uh, most of my career after I graduated uh, with a degree in political science and a law degree from the University of Montana. Um, yeah, banging around the world, uh, uh, principally living and working out of Denver, uh, developing uh, and financing energy projects for the last 15, almost 20 years, uh, developing exclusively renewable energy projects um, around the world, really uh, pretty much on every continent, some places that um, I enjoyed being and many places that I'd rather not go again. Um, but I currently... Uh, I'm uh, proud to hold the Worth Chair in Sustainable Development at the University of Colorado. Uh, it is an endowed chair that um, serves to uh, study, research, educate, and learn about uh, sustainable development in all of its forms. And since we're talking this evening about the connection between, uh, or the balance between environmental uh, protection, environmental issues, and energy, um, the, the concept of sustainability is really, I think, a, a pretty good place to, to lead off our thinking uh, about that. Um, I think this is going to work. Uh, so let's start here. Let's, let's do history. Probably seemed like a good idea at the time, right? I, I think that most thinking people these days would interpret this uh, verse from Genesis to means something like we have to be good stewards of the earth and we have to uh, provide for uh, that stewardship which uh, enhances rather than destroys the planet. Um, but in the Western world, we've been guided by this principle uh, through much of our history, through much of the history of the developed world and particularly the history of uh, the Industrial Revolution and, and its uh, consequent uh, impact on the planet. Um, there were some, some brighter spots along the way. Uh, the Sun King, Louis XIV, uh, put his civil service to work for a number of years in France in, in 1669 and the years leading up to 1669 because the forests of France had been completely destroyed as a consequence of the uh, innumerable and uh, never-ending naval wars that occurred during that period between France and Britain and Spain and Portugal. Uh, the forests had been completely destroyed um, to harvest wood to make uh, ships with tall masts. And Louis XIV commissioned uh, his civil servants to develop what he called the Ordinance of Water and Forest. And this is a quote from the Ordinance. Nicely done, Louis. I mean, right, that's the idea. And we, we see uh, evidence of that proposition all around us these days. And then we fast forward just a couple of hundred years to the uh, United Nations uh, World Commission on the Environment and Development, so-called the Brundtland Commission, named after uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland, who was the Prime Minister of Norway and the chair of the commission. The report that was produced, as you all probably know, is called the Brundtland Report, uh, and it defined uh, going back now 30 years ago almost, what we call sustainable development, which is development which meets the needs of current generations without negatively affecting the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, I think most of us know the stories of Native American tribes in the, in the Americas who had programs or policies, that they didn't call them policies, I guess that's our modern term for them, but that they wouldn't make decisions uh, that didn't um, take into account the impact of those decisions on at least the next seven generations. And I think that the Brundtland Report, whether intentionally or not, just kind of uh, adopted that idea and, and tried to move us forward. Um, a lot of goals, a lot of objectives, a lot of plans have been stated by uh, not just the United Nations, but the World Bank, uh, the other de large development banks in the world around the question of how do we sustainably develop? And this, um, I'm here to tell you, because it's um, uh, my work and my days and nights are filled with it, is an exceedingly complicated question. It's a question that all of your panelists this evening will 
uh, echo the complexity of for you. It is um, really difficult to think about how to develop, how to grow, how to prosper economically and socially without damaging the environment, without, without destroying uh, the sustainable uh, the sustainability of, of the planet. We have to live here. And um, like so many people who talk about climate change, uh, I always lead in with the phrase, I'm not a scientist, but, well, I'm not a scientist. Um, sometimes I wish I was a scientist, but I, but I do know some simple things. The Earth is a balanced organism. I know one other thing, and this is something I share with every class I teach and every presentation I make, I try to work this one in, um, I always say, how many of you are worried about the planet? Anybody out there worried about the planet? I'm not worried about the planet. Because here's the thing. The planet will treat human beings the same way that our bellies treat a virus or a bacteria. If, they, if the planet gets enough of us, it'll just go ahead and expel us. Okay? We won't live here anymore. The planet will be fine. It might be a dry, dusty rock for a couple of million years, but it's fine. It'll keep circling the sun, and, uh, and, and we'll, it'll just recover in whatever way it needs to recover and become whatever it needs to be, and it'll still be the planet. Uh, we won't be here to see it. What it takes, in my opinion, to get through this, to figure this out, to understand development, to understand the nexus between environmental protection and the production of energy that we need for our lives, what it takes is a dedicated and committed attitude. It takes a dedicated and committed method of critical thought, and only critical thought. And we don't any of us have enough time every day to think critically about everything we do, but we do have time to think critically and deeply about policy issues as they relate to energy and the environment. Quick example or two. Bob, you're in the grocery store. You're going through the checkout line. You're going to be asked a question. Paper or plastic? What's your answer? You can't answer that way because you might have, but you left them in the damn car, okay? So I'll cancel that. Paper or plastic? Those are your choices? Paper, because it's recyclable. Yeah. What about plastic? Is that recyclable? Anybody know how many times you can recycle a paper bag? Give me a guess. Maybe 10. If the fiber in the, pa in the bag is really robust, if it's a relatively new bag, maybe 10, but maybe four or five for most paper bags. Anybody know how many times you can recycle a plastic bag? Plastic's made out of uh, hydrocarbons, right? It's made out of oil. You can recycle a plastic bag infinitely. Okay, I'm not advocating for the use of plastic bags. I'm just saying, think about it critically. The question is, is the wrong question. The question is not paper or plastic. The question is, what the hell are you going to do with the bag when you get it home? If you're going to recycle it, and you can take it somewhere where it will be recycled and not just throw it in a bin that says recycle on it, because that doesn't mean it'll be recycled. But if you're really going to recycle it, pick the plastic bag. If you're going to use it uh, for waste and send it to a landfill, then, then take the paper bag, because it will decompose. It's organic. But if you want to recycle, recycle plastic. It's pretty simple. There's a lot more to it than that, but there are a lot more critical thought uh, we could put into it. But how many of us want to spend that much time thinking about what kind of bag we want? Uh, waterless urinals, another one of my favorites. This is mostly for the guys, right? Um, anybody seen a waterless urinal? What an innovation. No water. So I, I thought, how does that work? I thought, well, it must be some kind of pump that sucks the liquid down the urinal into the sewage system, right? That's got to be what it is. But a pump will use electricity. So I started thinking about this, and I thought, well, let me dig into this. Well, a waterless urinal doesn't work that way. It doesn't have a pump, and it's not, uh, it's not any of that. What it is is there's a hockey puck-sized cake of special material in the urinal, and it's the most super-absorbent material ever developed by man. And when the liquid is uh, trapped by this hockey puck, uh, after a few days, when it's reached its capacity, someone comes in and takes it out and throws it away. So I thought, well, I need to understand what that hockey puck's made out of. Well, it's not an organic product. <laughs> it might save some water, 
Um, but it's, it's, of course, made from, from oil, right? So there's a lot of critical thought that's wanting and that's needed. Uh, I'll skip the well for water example. Um, it's an example from Nepal, but I, won't, I don't want to cut short our time. Uh, we want to get engaged in some dialogue here. Um, we we want to talk about what's next. And not just about what, um, what we can do next, but what we should do next. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to the next presenter. Thank you. I'd like to introduce and bring up uh, Dr. Lynn Borberg, who's a professor here at the University of Montana. So let's uh, give a warm welcome. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight on another nice night in Missoula. Um, I want to start by thanking the Mansfield Center for uh, putting on this conference and inviting me to share some of my thoughts with you all and the panelists here tonight. Uh, it's an important dialogue on an issue that's uh, a critical one for our times, and that's just the kind of thing that Mike Mansfield would have done, and uh, therefore the center continues to carry on Senator Mansfield's uh, important legacy. When I was first asked to speak tonight, I thought, well, let's see, uh, the delicate balance. I'm an environmental studies professor, and so what I know really well is the environmental movement and uh, how they're trying to negotiate the issue of trying to save the environment while at the same time negotiating the issues of economics and other issues, political issues that are out there. So what I thought I'd do with you folks tonight and the panelists is kind of share the diversity of thought that there is in the environmental movement and uh, what that means for the ways forward of resolving that interest perhaps um, and then give you an example of that and then maybe talk about some things that are a little bit more global here in the few minutes I have for an introduction. So first thing I, that's important to know is that for the environmental movement, and I'm going to focus on uh, coal and fossil fuel consumption as an issue uh, for creating our energy, because that's where most of our energy still comes from in the United States and, quite frankly, throughout much of the world. But it's a problem. Uh, and it's a problem for the environmental movement for more reasons than simply uh, climate change. Uh, the environmental movement is concerned about fossil fuel consumption for reasons of public health issues and the release of some toxics and exposure of people to that and the particles, et cetera, that are emitted. Uh, for environmental justice, the disproportionate burden uh, of pollution borne by minority and lower income communities. Uh, for degradation of wildlands and fish and wildlife habitat, the deposition of mercury uh, is a nationwide problem and limits uh, what people can eat from our natural environment, uh, and uh, recreation issues. I'm not going to focus on those tonight, but it's always important to kind of think, keep those in the back of your mind as it's not as simple as, well, just solving the energy problem. It intersects with everything else. And so as uh, Mr. Safdie has already related to us, it's, it's, a complicated, it's a complicated prospect. But from the environmental movement perspective, you always have to kind of keep that full plate in the back of your mind. When we do focus on uh, climate change issues, there's still variation within the views of the environmental community of the way forward and how we need to deal with it. One wing of the environmental movement focuses on technical solutions and crafting environmental regulations that drive change. A really good example of this is the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, they're emblematic of this viewpoint, and they've been a key player in advancing regulatory approaches under the Clean Air Act here in the United States that have resulted in Obama administration rules like the Clean Power Plan, which is a plan that sets state-by-state -state reductions in emissions tailored uh, to the amount of fossil fuel generation. So NRDC, whose logo is up there in the left-hand corner, uh, endorses flexibility, allowing different states to take different approaches to meeting their power needs while reducing emissions with a mix of energy-efficient measures uh, efficiency measures, rather, conversion to less emitting generation, although fossil fueled source, perhaps, and advancing renewable generation using wind and solar. It's tolerant of some degree of coal-fired generation, especially in the near future. Another uh, organization, National Organization of the Same Ilk, is the Environmental Defense Fund, or EDF, uh, whose logo you see at the top of the screen, 
Um, they have acted much as NRDC has. Uh, they also engage in Asia uh, and are working with the Chinese government now, apparently, to try, so they claim anyway, to install a uh, cap and trade market based emission control system there. Um, the president of EDF in a blog just a couple weeks ago said, How to save the environment? Be reasonable. So the attitude of EDF is very much to try and find a path forward and maybe of a more moderate or tolerant uh, view towards continued fossil fuel electricity generation. Um, more aggressive stance uh, is adopted by national groups like the Sierra Club and 350.org. Sierra Club has worked in a broad coalition of groups now for several years, from national to regional to local, to fight the permitting of new coal plants and to seek the retirement of many others. Um, the slide, let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, there, this slide shows the progress that has been made under this campaign, uh, and it's rather impressive. Since 2010, 187 coal plants across the United States have announced that they're going to shut down or have actually shut down. The lower bars are the ones that are actually retired, and then the, the higher bars are the ones that uh, have announced that they're retired plus the retirements. So that's the cumulative total, and actually it comes to close to one-third of uh, the nameplate capacity of coal generation in the United States, and it's projected to get there by the end of this year. So that's a pretty impressive uh, record of change. Um, Accompanying this decline in the number of coal plants, we have a decline in uh, coal generation as a proportion of our energy supply here in the United States. This slide shows the near-term trend, and it shifts when it goes from red to blue from a year to year to a month to month. And that peak you see uh, represents the polar vortex uh, last winter, not this current winter. Goodness knows the East has had its challenges this winter, too. Um, but that's resulted in a spike of bringing coal plants back online to meet the electricity demand for heating, no doubt. Um, so the Sierra Club is committed to significant reduction of coal-fired generation, as you can see. At the same time, even they, I don't think, realistically expect uh, that coal will be completely eliminated in the power sector. Shifting to 350.org again, um, they use people power to dismantle the influence and infrastructure of the fossil fuel industry and to develop people-centric solutions to the climate crisis. And therefore, they oppose the use of fossil fuels for electricity generation. Their current divestment campaign, which you may have encountered here on campus as part of the festivities here, seeks to undermine the financial power of the fossil fuel industry, for example. And they're working in India to stop the proposed wave of coal-fired plants there. Uh, this is a slide that shows uh, from an internet site the proposed coal-fired plants in India. Uh, and although there are a number of deferred, canceled, unconfirmed, and uncertain plants, the total of those that are actually moving forward in some stage is an astonishing 498 plants. Um, so I'll go touch a little bit later, maybe save some of the comments for our discussion on Asian electrification issues uh, and some of its implications for fossil fuel emissions. So at the national level, we have a variation among groups in terms of how receptive they are. But nonetheless, there's a strand of agreement of tolerance that fossil fuels will play some continuing role in the power sector. Locally, um, we had the Montana Environmental Information Center and the Blue Skies campaign illustrating some of the diversity that we have. Um, the Montana Environmental Information Center, or MEIC, has staunchly opposed new coal plants in Montana, uh, like the proposed Highwood plant outside of Great Falls that uh, did not end up happening, and closely tracks permitting and enforcement of clean air rules on power plants. So uh, they have been working within the regulatory system to try and address the issue. The Blue Skies Campaign is part of a coalition of groups uh, of which 350.org is a part uh, that seek to oppose coal exports because of climate change impacts and local health impacts. And this is uh, some of those Blue Sky folks locally acting. 
They've used uh, administrative approaches, protest, and even civil disobedience to emphasize the strength of their convictions and to highlight the connection of coal to health issues and climate change. So there can be very strong feelings among the population and among environmental groups on, on these issues, which is something that has to be dealt with if we're going to find a way to move forward together. Nonetheless, uh, a, one example locally that I think is uh, interesting to contemplate, and perhaps an example of at least one way forward, is MEIC's work with a natural gas plant uh, in Butte, Montana. The natural gas plant developer was a local fellow. He grew up and spent all his life around the Butte area. Uh, he knew that MEIC was going to be interested in his permit. And so he approached MEIC before he even applied for the permit as he was developing the full plan for his natural gas plant, power plant, and MEIC jumped at the chance to work with him. And MEIC and he sat down and they came to an agreement and he created a plant that had state-of-the-art pollution controls on it, uh, but went through permitting largely unopposed and has been operating now for several years. Um, so engagement is possible and can work to move us forward, meeting our power needs, at the same time making progress on climate change and uh, public health concerns. You need people that are willing to do that extra work uh, to get together and find a way through. Certainly renewable generation will need to be a large part of the story moving ahead. Key to the acceptance of this Butte natural gas plant, for instance, by MEIC was its role as firming power for wind generation because the quick start up capacity of natural gas plants can get electricity on the grid when the wind doesn't blow, as well as their reduced contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, yet even the staunchest of fossil fuel opponents would likely concede that total elimination of coal or gas from the worldwide energy generation picture is unlikely, and some would even say it's unnecessary. So if we turn to Asia as kind of part of the other title we have here, the Asia-Montana Energy Summit, uh, this poses conundrums too, which I think we'll explore more uh, in the time to come here tonight. But I think key to this is there are, of course, millions, if not over, well over a billion people around the world in developing countries without access to the slightest of reliable energy sources. And this impedes education, exacerbates poverty, and limits the, their quality of life. Um, yet at the same time, developing their energy system in the same way we have, dependent on extensive fossil fuel use, uh, is counterproductive overall for the planet, simply because of the increase in greenhouse gas emissions, but also because of the inability uh, to have the finance to and infrastructure to deliver electricity to remote locations. So uh, we have some possible directions we can go there. I will uh, be willing to offer those uh, if there's interest. Uh, let me just show as well here to give a picture of Asia. These are proposed uh, coal plants for China. And all of these are in some stage of development. Some of them have been canceled or whatever. But within those circles, there are numbers that you probably can't see. Those are the number of plants that make up that area. So, you know, you see numbers as high as 34 and 32 within each one of those circles. So it's quite an extensive number of plants. And here, of course, is India and their proposed coal rollout as it's proceeding. Now, India has, uh, for every one plant that goes forward, they have six that actually don't go forward now. Uh, so this may be a drastic overestimate, but still it's a substantial number and we're going to need to figure out how to move forward with that yet at the same time electrify or provide basic services to a large number of people across the world. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Robert Duffy. If you please uh, join us. And then um, We'll have one more uh, speaker, and then we'll get into some discussion, some questions. Uh, we've got an intimate group here tonight, uh, so let's make this comfortable, and uh, we send everybody home with a little bit more knowledge, so thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Robert Duffy. I currently teach at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. 
I'm the chair of the political science department. Uh, my research background, before I became chair of the political science department, I had more time for research, but I uh, have written on commercial nuclear power regulation in the United States. I've written a little bit on integrating climate, energy, and air pollution policy. Um, I've also done some research on environmental organizations, like Professor Bomberg here. Um, and then a second sort of strand of research that I sort of got into was looking at interest groups and federal elections and the role of money in federal elections. So that may explain some of what I'm about to say a little bit uh, on this topic. So the topic of the conversation is the delicate balance between energy development and the environment. Is there a middle ground? And as I was thinking about how to approach this, I decided I would take a literal approach to this question. And so I, I think, my, in my opinion, the the extremely unsatisfactory answer to that question is it depends. Uh, some forms of energy development pose greater environmental harms than others. The extraction and burning of coal, for example, poses a different order and magnitude of risk uh, to the environment than other energy sources. Wind, for example, poses fewer development concerns, I think, than, than coal does. Uh, I think the question of where decisions are made, at what level of government they're made, also matters if you're talking about policy making at the federal level or policy making at the state or local level. Uh, as American politics has become more polarized in recent years, uh, a host of issues that were once seemingly bipartisan, at least on the surface, and had bipartisan support are now entangled in the partisan scrum that involves pretty much almost every issue you can think of uh, in Washington these days. And it's simply harder to compile a list of energy issues where the parties agree or where either side believes that they have an incentive to compromise or seek a middle ground with the other folks. Um, as policy makings become gridlock in Washington, a lot of the energy no pun intended, on, on energy policy making has moved to the states uh, where people thought they maybe have a better opportunity to shape policy. But we also now have a lot of one-party states where one side is able to push through their policy agenda without having to do much in the way of compromising or seeking a middle ground with the other party. So today we have some states that are eliminating the renewable portfolio standards while others are seeking to make them more ambitious. Some states have embraced fracking while others like New York have imposed bans on the practice. Some states have policies that encourage homeowners to install rooftop solar panels and others are looking to either make that harder or more expensive for customers to do the same thing. Uh, so the reality is that there aren't that many states right now where the conditions are conducive to elected officials at least seeking a middle ground. Uh, we might talk a little bit later maybe about Colorado, which has sort of an interesting experience in terms of trying to find a middle ground in terms of how to handle the fracking dispute. Uh, Mark may know more about that than I do, but perhaps we can, we can talk about that. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things I noticed earlier today in listening to some of the panels is that folks, uh, a number of the folks note who were, spoke, were speaking noted correctly that predicting future energy, energy policy is sort of a fool's uh, task, that it's very difficult to do those sorts of things because there are so many unknowns, including what happens in terms of science and technology. Uh, and at the same time, I also noticed in a lot of the talks that there was sort of this implicit, sometimes explicit hope that was expressed that some sort of scientific or technological breakthrough would make it possible or easier for us to achieve balance, to help us sort of avoid a lot of those difficult trade-offs that might be involved in terms of uh, environmental protection and energy development. Sort of a, a sense that something would happen in some laboratory somewhere that, that would enable us to eat our cake and have it too. Well, uh, we've seen this for decades. It's kind of a staple uh, in, in energy policy. As I said earlier, one of my first projects was looking at commercial nuclear power regulation in the United States. And there was that sort of famous hope expressed in the 1950s that it would one day be possible to provide electricity that was too cheap to meter. Well, you still see similar sort of hopes about science and technological breakthroughs paving the way for nuclear power in the future, whether it be in the form of new, a new generation of reactors with passive solar, passive safety features, or small modular reactors which just pose less of a danger in the event of a malfunction of some sort. In renewable energy, we hear this, you know, when folks talk about some sort of breakthrough, maybe in, the, in concentrating solar 
uh, in energy storage, there's the desire and the quest for, for better batteries. Coal supporters are always talking about the next step in clean coal and in carbon sequestration uh, and, and storage. Uh, it would be great if we had those sorts of things that sort of made the middle ground and the trade-off easier. Uh, Ultimately, though, uh, again, in my opinion, I think the search for a balance between energy development and environmental protection is really, at base, a political question. Uh, scientific uh, experts and technological experts can provide insight into that, you know, but ultimately the decision has to be made um, in, in and through political processes, as frustrating as that may sound. Uh, so I'm talking about things like elections, legislation, rulemaking, and yeah, litigation. I mean, those are how a lot of these uh, decisions will also be, uh, be made. And now, ideally, those processes would be informed by scientific and technical information, not only by public officials, but also by the public as well. Uh, the public needs to pay attention to energy debates, which are complicated. Uh, they're nuanced. Uh, and the public needs to hold officials accountable for the decisions that they make uh, when legislating and, and making rules. Uh, so again, in my opinion, scientists and engineers can tell us what the risks are, but it's up to the public to decide whether that level of risk is acceptable. Uh, and it's up to the public to decide what trade-off between energy development and environmental protection they find acceptable. Now, unfortunately, our current political process uh, doesn't give us much faith that it can deliver on that sort of ideal sentiment I expressed. All too often, as we all know, uh, discussion of energy issues in this country uh, is superficial and little more than a repetition of slogans or talking points meant to sort of score points in elections or cast the other side as some sort of uh, um, demon that, that doesn't really have the best interests of the country at heart. Uh, but, but ultimately, I think that's where uh, those questions need to be resolved. And so on that uplifting note, uh, I will cede the floor and look forward to the rest of our conversation. Thanks. I'd like to introduce Arnie Sherman. Good evening, everyone. I'm Arnie Sherman. Uh, I've spent uh, the last 17 years running uh, the Montana World Trade Center and teaching at the business school here, and uh, for 25 years have traveled to more than uh, 100 countries um, and have done business around the world. And my approach tonight, in the brief time we have, is to talk about sort of the intersection between the environment, energy, and business uh, from a global perspective. And in doing my uh, homework for, for this assignment, I came across uh, an article entitled Beyond Environmental Extremism, Finding a Middle Ground. And I said, I'm gonna plagiarize the hell out of this for, uh, for the, our evening presentation. And my uh, better side um, uh, uh, talked me out of it. But I did wanna read the opening uh, line from the article. It's from the Christian Science Monitor. I thought that was a, a good source to uh, find an article. And the opening line was, or the opening uh, sentences, seldom if ever, since Rachel Carson touched off the environmental movement in the 60s with her book Silent Spring, has the public debate over, na of the, over the nation's environmental policy ever been as bitter, as strident as they are today? So how many of you in here would agree with that statement? Anybody? Pretty much, right? What I found surprising about this is that the article was written in August 3rd, 1982. 33 years ago. Some of you may remember back 33 years, that was when uh, James Watt was interior secretary and there was talk of acid rain and this article was written at that time talking about that this was the worst possible uh, and bitter political environment to discuss environment and energy and, uh, and extremism and trying to find a middle ground. And so I guess one of the questions we can talk about is, have things improved since then, or have they gotten even worse than was imagined at that time? Um, 
As I look at the, the topic, I, I, my position has been in, in traveling around the world and again, working with lots of companies, global companies. I've been in a lot of boardrooms. I've been in a lot of senior business strategy sessions in this continent and abroad. I have rarely, if ever, heard a discussion about environmental improvement or environmental uh, uh, you know, change in the company unless they were uh, being subpoenaed, audited, uh, sued, or litigated against. Um, we had a good uh, discussion just, uh, just right before from Professor Duffy about the politics of all of this, and politics certainly play a tremendous role in this discussion of whether there is a delicate balance. I don't think anything is delicate about this issue, and I don't think, frankly, from what I've seen from a business perspective, there's much of a middle ground. You know, the, the development of alternative energy around the world is driven in most part by uh, government and government grants and public, uh, the public sector. Uh, and we have a political environment now in this country, for better or for worse, uh, in which uh, we marginalize not only science but government. We even marginalize industry to some extent in this, in this debate uh, about uh, environment versus energy, free market versus... Uh, unfettered uh, you know, business access around the world. I've never been in a corporate boardroom in a business uh, environment where they've discussed the, the United Nations Global Compact. Never come up for a discussion in, in any business setting, uh, except, uh, I make the caveat, unless there's something happening. I've been, in, I've been in meetings with senior strategists at companies like Walmart and, and uh, uh, our nuclear laboratories, all, all across industry spectrums. And, it, and it's rare, if ever, that, that a genuine discussion about how do we do anything but increase profits and avoid taxes takes place. It's, it's mostly uh, uh, the, uh, the, you know, to the benefit of the consumer, to the env environment, to the country to the populace is, is rarely ever brought up or, or rarely ever discussed. So it's t to me, it's very difficult to consider a middle ground in, in, uh, in an environment where business in general only do what they're required to do, forced to do, or litigated to do. Uh, you know, if companies are, if businesses are, are worried about the environment, they buy insurance, you know. Yeah, or they think that industry or science will come up with some solution to the consequences of their behavior. And we've seen example over and over again of this. I just read as I was looking last night about Duke Energy and Dukeville, North Carolina. Anybody know what's happening down there? Some of you probably do. So Dukeville is named after Duke Energy, a nice little town of about 3,200. Uh, Duke Energy is now providing bottled water to 81 families in that town because their wells have been polluted by coal ash ponds. When Duke Energy uh, put those coal ash ponds in Dukeville, uh, they had considered lining them but chose not to, primarily because it was expensive. And uh, you know they assured the community that uh, there wasn't going to be any problem. Well now, 81 homes within a mile of the coal ash pond or can't drink their water, and Duke Energy's response is to provide bottled water to those homes. Some of those wells have been in existence since the Civil War. And they said if they are found culpable, you know, they will, which I think they already have, but it, you know, if legally and finally it's adjudicated that they are culpable, they're going to uh, uh, put a water pipe and pipe water into Dukeville, their namesake town, so that the citizens will have an alternative to their uh, wells. I say that because there are example after example of, of changes taking place, but again, only when forced to, only when litigated to, and only when it, you know, it's a, a PR advantage. You know, again, unless it, you're in the industry or unless there's lucrative government subsidies where you know, around the world, when you take a look at Iceland, Germany, other places where alternative energy is, uh, is developing and renewable energy is developing, it is with a, a large role of the government taking leadership and, and driving that. With, with, without that, with just market forces leading the effort to encourage uh, a middle ground or s some compromise, I just, I just don't see it happen. I don't see the discussion taking place. I don't see the, 
the political leadership have the, uh, the guts, the will, or the, uh, or the integrity, or the in industry leadership to do it without being forced to. So maybe that will help stimulate some discussion, and those are just some general comments I wanted to share with the group, and let's uh, move forward to, and uh, go beyond that. Thank you. Question. Let's talk about what we know. We know that the general population right now on the planet is roughly about 7 billion people. By most estimates, by 2050, they expect another 2 billion people on the planet. The majority of that growth is going to occur in the areas that are the least prepared in terms of infrastructure, stable governments, resource availability, um, and the ability to meet basic needs. Those are things that maybe we can agree on, we know. Living in the developed countries, um, life is pretty good, and our standard of living by anything historically is unlike anything we've seen on the planet. So let's take the premise that we've got it, they want it. How do you deal with this even slight increase of this burgeoning population, and let's even call it middle class, that's going to be growing and demanding and using more consumer goods, whether it's more automobiles in China? or different diets. We've seen the world's diet change using certain things that we've been enjoying for many decades. So, uh, Mark, would you just like to start the conversation in terms of that's what we know. How are we going to be able to meet this challenge to find that middle ground, especially with concerns on the environment? I'll take a crack at it, but first I want to say it's going to be very tough to follow a guy who's not only wearing a green jacket, but green shoes. And I don't think there's any question about where he stands on these issues. I, I think, um, Bob, um, that's a, it's a really important question. Um, one that I've done a lot of work on over the last few years. Um, and I think the, the short answer is start by getting the facts right. Um, you can read criticisms, critiques, concerns um, published by any number of experts in the field about um, the Millennium Development Goals, soon to be recast as the Sustainable Development Goals. And there's a specific Millennium Development Goal adopted by the United Nations which relates to energy access. And the goal is that the 1.3 billion people on the planet, roughly 20% of the population of the planet, that have zero access to electricity. I'm not talking about a few hours a day. I'm not talking about the people in Delhi or Mumbai who, who suffer frequent power outages. I'm talking about people who have no access to any electricity and never have. The Millennium Development Goals are that those people should have reliable access to electric energy by the year 2030. And the critiques that are out there will suggest to you that that's an overwhelming, impossible challenge. The carbon implications of which are, are difficult to comprehend. Well, the facts are, first of all, that energy access to all, as defined by the United Nations Millennium Development Goals, is not what you might think. It's not the same thing as you have in your house. It is the ability for a rural dweller in a place like East Africa or Southeast Asia to have 250 kilowatt hours a year of electricity, or an urban dweller in those regions to have 500 kilowatt hours of electricity a year. How much is 250 kilowatts of electricity? Turn on two small light bulbs, really small ones, for six hours a day and you're used it up. How much is 500 for the urban developer? Go down to the Home Depot and buy the cheapest, smallest uh, Energy Star uh, refrigerator you can buy and turn it on and leave it on and you've consumed your allotment for the year. To achieve the Millennium Development Goals at the current stated level, will have a carbon impact of less than 1% of carbon emissions in the world from electric generation. It's not the problem of the poor and it shouldn't be put on the poor to solve. If we all consumed 1% less electricity next year, those goals could be met with a net, with a net zero carbon impact. I'd like to following up on that then, in terms of meeting this, who delivers the systems? Who actually provides the infrastructure necessary to even meet minimal requirements. Um, and, and it brings up issues such as governance, uh, accountability, uh, things that sometimes we don't think about. So Len, if you'd like to take that, please. Sure. And, and who pays for it? Well, it, always the question is who pays for it? Well, I, I know Mark probably has more extensive experience with this, but I know that in many developing areas, 
what is actually happening is that small businesses are being created to provide affordable ways to deliver a, a very modest amount of electricity to homes. And for those people, having the ability to have their homes lighted to any degree after it gets dark without having to use a kerosene lamp, which is the primary source of light in the developing world, is a terrific asset to them because the kerosene is expensive for them. Uh, it may cost 50% or more of what they make in a day. And it is uh, also uh, damaging to their health and their children's health in those enclosed environments burning a kerosene lamp. Um, and so many companies are being founded around the world uh, that are seeking to deliver very compact solar systems that work in many of those areas very well to deliver a reliable source of electricity for the home. And there's all different kinds of models to do this. There is a central charging station in a village where people come and instead of paying the amount they would pay for kerosene every day, uh, someone in their family would be charged with doing that, they go and they pay to rent a lantern, a solar lantern. And then they bring it back in the morning and the solar station collects it again and charges it. So they like lease the lantern every night. Or it can be small systems that are uh, in the homes. So the, the level of infrastructure is to deliver that is nowhere near what uh, we would expect on so our Are homes. you talking principally though of rural areas versus urban areas? Because one of the things you have to understand is that for the first time in history, urban and rural is about 50-50 in terms of people living in the urban areas versus rural right. areas. It's expected that in the not too distant future, you're gonna see that flip and there'll be a dramatic increase of those living in the urban areas, which mm -hmm. alters some of these equations somewhat too. So some comments, and Arnie, please uh, jump in. So Len, would you like to comment on that in relation well, to what I, you were just saying? I, I, I think, again, other uh, panelists will probably have uh, more to say on this, but, uh, but the shift to a more urban environment, again, it's kind of how you classify urban and what, uh, how you classify the statistics of what's urban. But the other thing that's arising is uh, mini grids where uh, companies are looking to install small grids that are not connected to a giant central grid that are powered by micro hydro, wind, or solar, or a combination of those. But that requires coordination between the users and management of demand in each household so you don't kill the system. And, and that's a challenging social prospect. And so there's a lot of things to be worked out with that. So I wanted to ask a question to the group. I'm not the moderator, but I just thought hey, No, 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 there is, I'm asking questions. I want this to be I'll keep. I'll keep you in line. You go. I'll keep you in line. So particularly when you're dealing with, uh, you know, oil and, and natural gas, they're, 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 they use extremely large amount of water, you know, four million gallons to frack a well. California's got the problem it has. Chairman of Nestle's recently, recently said water is not a human right, you know. So, well, you know, what is, what is the take of this group on, you know, on, on that question alone? Is, you're worried about electricity, there, there's water shortage all over the world that we're rationing it in many countries. Is water a human right? And how does that fit into this, you know, equation? What's the second most consumptive use of water in the United States? Electric production, cooling for natural gas and coal-fired power plants. It's, it's not a human right. It's something we have to protect and preserve. Bob? Robert? I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I, years ago, I was doing research on coal bed methane exploration at the beginning of the boom there, and I was just astonished, being an Easterner, uh, that so much water was being used to 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 free up the coal bed methane gas in, in a part of the country that had no rain <laughs> or snowfall. It sort of struck me as an odd, an odd scenario. But yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with Mark. I, in my opinion, it's a human right. It should be. Along this line, does somebody want to comment on the, what parts of the world actually have water? I mean, this is a serious issue in terms of if you're going to raise standards of living, what areas have advantages and what areas are at disadvantages in terms of actual access to water? Anybody care to comment? So Asia, one of the fastest growing regions population-wise, also is at the largest disadvantage 
in terms of having access to water for industrial purposes, commercial? Um, Len, please. Well, it, it's important, too, to say what kind of water do you want to have access right. to? Because potable water, there's problems with potable water, even in places that are replete with rain, mm -hmm. that they simply do not have infrastructure in place to separate waste from water, and that that then breeds problems, uh, public health problems. So um, it's a it's not you wouldn't you immediately you think you know the image comes to mind of some very arid country, desert country that has very low precipitation, but it can be as much of a water desert for a community in a monsoon country as it can be in, in a desert. California. I've done a lot of work on hydroelectric development in various parts of the world, and I think one of the things we always forget about water, Bob, is that um, there's a temporal aspect of water, too. There's, the temporality of it is that you might have a lot of water in a particular region, but you'll have it for six weeks a year. And, you, you know, the, the infrastructure that's required to store and make that water potable and to develop uh, hydroelectric projects that... Um, uh, that can use that stored water ha have colossal environmental considerations. And, you know, the law of unintended consequences is the only law that's been in effect since the beginning of time and always will be. And I, I was talking to a colleague from Northern Europe last week, and he said, um, I, I think I've got it. He said, let's just uh, do what Chairman Mao did. And he told me a story, which is probably apocryphal, about Chairman Mao and the fruit fly infestation in China years ago. Um, the story is that um, there were fruit flies everywhere in the cities and the countryside, and it was the worst infestation the country had ever experienced. And the chairman geared up the production at all the fly swatter factories in China and mandated that every man, woman, and child own two fly swatters. And everybody kill a fly, you know, one, at least once a day. Well, problem solved, right? You got 1.3 billion people, took care of a lot of flies. So, so my colleague's idea is, well, let's, let's plant trees. Every person in the world plant a tree. And my first thought was, that's a great idea. You absorb a tremendous amount of CO2 with a tree. But I wonder if anybody's thought about the water implications of planting a few billion trees. We're, we're messing with the planet now, okay? And we think we're messing with it in a good way, but the law of unintended consequences will, will bear out. I want to get back to what Professor Duffy was talking about, the politics of this. I find it ironic to be at a time where on one extreme on a political spectrum, you have a chairman of environmental and public works, uh, you know, Senator Imhoff from, from Oklahoma saying, climate change is the greatest hoax perpetrated on the American public in all history. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have the Pope now taking on a role as a global leader of environmental stewardship. What does that say about the, about the environment that we're living in politically? Probably the first time the Pope and James Imhoff have been invoked in the same sentence, I think. <laughs> yeah, but. <probably. laughs> Uh, can, can, the, the question was, what does that say about the political process? Yeah, what does it say about when you, you have the Pope and, and, and him on, on, the end of, uh, on the end of the spectrum? Yeah, and the, and the fact that folks are upset with the Pope right. for, for saying that. He's been misinformed, <laughs> saying. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a hard time with some of the... I, I was talking before about how I believe science and technology is sort of an important part, but, right. but in, in, in one of the parties today, there's, it's, it's political suicide in a, for a presidential candidate in particular to sort of accept what's conventional wisdom. I mean, they had to pull teeth to get a vote in the United States Senate to acknowledge that climate change was real. And I, I can't remember, but I think the vote about whether climate change was caused by mankind was, was defeated or wasn't allowed to come up for a vote. It was just, was it, you know, was it real? And, you know, again, well, so from, from, from my standpoint, in terms of having an honest discussion and a nuanced discussion of a complicated issue, that's a problem. It's, it's a huge problem. Uh, you know, Mark mentioned earlier, he said, I'm not a scientist. I found it very interesting. I think the audience will find it uh, interesting as we go through this political process of electing a new president. You go to any of the announced... Uh, uh, political candidates, and I'll say it on the Republican side at this point in time, and you ask them a military question, none of them have served in the military, but they'll, give you, they'll talk about the military all day long. You ask them a question about foreign policy, none of them are foreign policy experts, but they'll tell you, you know, go on forever to talk about foreign policy and what's wrong and what they would do right. 
You, you know, ask about women's reproductive health, and they'll talk about it whether they know anything about it or not. You ask them about climate change, and the first thing they'll say is, well, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> you know, and they, you know, they won't deal with it. And, 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 that's, you know, and that's a travesty, given the fact that how much power president and Congress, particularly if they're of the same party at some point in the future, will have on, on, you know, on the future of, uh, of, of the issue we're talking about tonight. I've got a question, uh, Len, on the environmental side. I've heard recently several leading environmentalists have come out and said, you know, we weren't consider considering the expansion of nuclear energy. And for the first time that I can recall, I'm starting to hear some people say, you know, if we're going to get this bridge between our current usage and the future, that nuclear energy has to be a larger part of that because it is scalable and produces non-CO2 emitting electricity. We see China, India, a number of countries that are going to be scaling up uh, that usage. So from the environmental perspective, what's changing and what can you share in terms of those insights? Well, I, I think there's a fair amount of controversy within the environmental movement over nuclear sources still. Uh, the first major rub point is that we, I mean, the United States has not come to terms with its nuclear waste disposal issue, um, and we're still storing a lot of uh, spent uranium in pools that are supposed to be used for emergencies during meltdowns mm -hmm. at, at plants. And so uh, we haven't figured out a way to do that. I understand from some people that there are new technologies that will allow uh, the reuse of those rods and that that will solve quite a bit of the nuclear power issue. But, uh, and, and you have individuals like the, one of the former presidents of Greenpeace uh, who has become an outright nuclear power advocate. And it, I, I mean, it certainly, if you look at things through a climate change lens, it certainly is an attractive prospect for large centralized generation of very copious amounts of electricity. Um, but it's like, then the issue becomes, as I point out, it's a bigger picture than just climate change. What are, what are the impacts of uranium mining and reviving that interest, industry? Uh, what are the impacts of transporting it and the whole life cycle? And whether we're willing to tolerate the risks such as they are, even though they may be relatively infrequent, they, you know, uh, Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi didn't do anybody any favors in the nuclear industry. But we've lost far more people to carbon emissions oh, from absolutely. coal plants and other types of, you know, energy resources in terms of numbers of people. So, again, where's that middle ground? I mean, we want it all, but you can't have it because there's always a problem, right? Can I, can I be there's a little outrageous, some issues, so please. Can, can I be outrageous for a minute? Yeah. Uh, stupid idea, and we don't need it. Nuclear, I'm sorry, it's a really bad idea. We have everything we need except the ability to store it. We have the ability to generate on a market parity basis, grid parity basis, or close to it today, all the electricity we need from the sun and the wind. What we need is the technology to store it so that it can be used at times when we have demand but we have no sun or we have no wind. The cost of one nuclear plant in this country a mid-sized nuclear plant, even if you don't take into account the externalities. The cost of one nuclear plant exceeds the Department of Energy's budget for research and development into electricity storage. Not only does the cost exceed it, we have all kinds of hidden external costs, like the fact that if you build and operate a nuclear power plant in this country, you're not going to get it financed unless the federal government guarantees it, and you will never get it financed or built unless the federal government does, as it has repeatedly in the past, exempts the company that owns and operates the nuclear plant from claims by injured parties, whether from a meltdown or a disaster. Tort claims are not available to those people who are injured because the industry can't afford the potential claims for a meltdown or for damage. It's stupid. It's wasteful. It's over. We don't need it. We need storage capacity for electricity generation that is environmentally friendly. Hopefully the storage units we are able to develop will be, will be developed and manufactured with um, at least ethically sourced, if not environmentally pure materials. It's never going to be environmentally pure, but that's my provocative statement. You don't need it, but are you opposed to it? I mean, China's got 22 nuclear plants on the drawing board, and they're going to move forward with it. It's better than coal. 
If I may just follow up very quickly, I mean, I agree completely with, with what Mark said. I mean, if you were a utility executive trying to decide what to do with your money, you'd have to be insane to try to build a nuclear plant today in the absence of any sort of federal subsidy. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, it's just so enormously expensive to build a nuclear plant compared to the other options that are out there right now that that your, your sh shareholders should <laughs> revolt if someone was going to uh, provoke that. I mean, and that's just looking at the economic side. I mean, that the political... It's just so risky to, to, to consider that, uh, that, that I think it's highly unlikely that if, if the federal government doesn't subsidize a plant, that anyone else in their right mind would build one. That's in the United States. In the, in the United States, that's exactly right. So to, to Mark's point then, you've got the resources you mentioned to be able to do this. You don't need to new, use nuclear energy. So then what are the challenges to implementing the types of resources that you're talking about in terms of scalability? I mean, that's one of the issues that is legitimate in terms of what can you scale up that works in a economy like the U.S. or China or many other countries that is scalable and reliable that we can say can be in usage in the next maybe 15, 20, or 30 years. I ask you or anybody else want to tackle that question, please. Scalable and reliable. Uh, solar and wind are scalable and reliable. Um, it's... It just needs to be done. The California Public Utilities Commission announced two weeks ago that it believes, based on a series of extensive reports and analysis done by engineers, that the, that the grid in California can operate on 100% renewables, and that the goal of 50% renewable energy in California, which is a statutory mandate by the year 2030, will be achieved. In fact, um, they're in excess of 30% now and, and heading there. They've devoted money, they've devoted their policy uh, commitment to it, and they're getting it accomplished. And it will come from a combination of all kinds of storage technologies like pumped hydro, you pump water up and drop it through a hydroelectric generator during hours of the day when the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing. Uh, there are, are pretty much limitless, poss limitless possibilities for uh, expanding existing technologies and creating new technologies. This is one where science really can make a difference. Um, so I, it's at, at the risk of sounding kind of too all of the above about it, I think it's a combination of technologies mostly driven around what's effective for storage. I mean, you can now, in the state of California, uh, receive a payment of $2,000 a year from Pacific Gas and Electric if you will allow the utility to draw down the battery in your hybrid vehicle at night when it needs power. Um, you just pick up a check for 2,000, plug in your car at night, and if the system needs electricity, it'll pull off your battery. You get up in the morning and recharge your battery by driving the, uh, the combustion engine part of your hybrid. There is a, there's no limit to the innovation that can occur if we force it to occur and if we fund it properly. So to Robert's point earlier, it's not a possibly a scientific issue in terms of what you can do. It's a political issue. Um, if you would comment on that, please. I mean, there is a need for some political creativity among state legislatures, federal, federal officials, uh, public utility commissions, and businesses. I mean, you know, Mark's example here, uh, PG&E, was that, you know, that, that, that they're doing this presumably not out of the goodness of their hearts, but because it makes economic sense for them to do so. And Arnie, being, you mentioned earlier, you've been in a lot of boardrooms, a lot of discussions with business people. Um, what do you run into when this may come up, or what do you see just from your, you know, decades of experience? You know, as, as I mentioned earlier, what you're seeing in California, while there's industry interest in doing it, it makes economic sense, it's still driven by government. You just mentioned a subsidy, $2,000. You talked about the conversion to using 50% or more on the grid is being driven by subsidy and incentives to business and industry. I think government's legitimate role in, in the United States and around the world is, just, is to provide subsidy and incentive to move in this direction. It's not going to happen on its own. Yeah, Arnie, I wanted to ask you a question of what you thought about the, uh, my example from Montana here where uh, the gas plant developer approached the environmental uh, organization and tried to work out a deal ahead of time, try and find out what they were doing, and it seemed from your talk that there wasn't, that would be a fairly uncommon sort of thing, but do you think with the kind of push that you're seeing and the change you're seeing in the energy picture, kind of the graphs that I threw up there, that, that people are going to start looking for opportunity 
in the niches and spaces there and try and craft a new way through at all? You know, you always hope for that. And you see it more in, you know, in, uh, in Europe in many ways. I mean, Germany is a good example. Uh, you know, Iceland's a good example. Where that we're having that discussion and dialogue because there, there isn't the polemic political, you know, diatribe that's taking place here. You know, you don't have to, uh, you know, pay homage to, you know, to the Koch brothers in order to run for office and, and you know, toe their line and follow what they're doing in, you know, in, in other in environments. So you see collaboration and discussion ahead of time about what's going to make sense and what's going to work. I mean, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have uh, all the buses in Iceland run, r running on renewables if there wasn't a dialogue between, you know, the, the bus company and the manufacturers and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the government, plus subsidy involved in doing that to make that happen. You wouldn't see a billion, a billion dollar desalinization plant in, in San Diego if there wasn't government involvement and government support in order for that to happen. It's not happening completely as a private venture. So, so Bob, do you have any insights then on, I mean, when we have this kind of changing landscape for coal, for instance, that's happening, and uh, certainly, although, you know, coal extraction interests are certainly going to dig their heels in because they, they have no other plan. It, they may be a diversified mining company, so they may have other minerals they can mine, but uh, utilities are pretty much looking and saying, well, writing's on the wall here for this, that, or the other thing. It doesn't make economic sense to run this old coal plant that's actually outlived its projected life by 20 years, and we're going to dump it. Um, why, in the face of that kind of nimbleness, is, does politics lag behind? Is there such money someplace, or is there, what, is, what, is, what is it that causes the lag time, it seems, between what's happening and, and the political stances we see? I wish, I wish I knew the answer to that. Uh, I, I think that there may be a, a financial reason for not seeing things that you should, you should be seeing. But, but I, I think as, as the finances change with the EPA rules uh, on coal power plants, et cetera, new and, new and existing coming down, that the, the equation, the cost equation, might change in a dramatic way for utilities where, where, where we're already seeing natural gas replacing coal and, and wind and solar sort of coming coming online that that you might just see more of that. I mean, I, I, I mean, I would like to think that that that, that would happen. Uh, but again, there are there there are companies who whose business is coal, who want to continue in that business and have made uh, extensive and generous use of contributions to, to federal officials along the way that have produced some benefits to them. You know, again, at, at the federal level and also in certain states. So Robert, I, I, would, I, I was going to say, I would say that the, the political contributions from uh, traditional energy sources, uh, the political lubrication they've, they've provided to the system is probably larger than the Defense Department of Energy's research budget by far. I mean, that's how much money, you, the, the disproportionality of, of that kind of lubrication where you end up, you know, frankly, with someone like Mitch McConnell saying he will never support, you know, the coal standards. I mean, that they're dead on arrival as far as he's concerned as a Senate Majority Leader is a point that you can't ignore while you're having a, a, a substantive debate about issues. If you have a regulatory body that's governed in a way in which, you know, a Senate Majority Leader can, you know, slam the door on policy that has bubbled up with consensus from a number of sources, you're operating in a, in a very stilted environment, and that's the reality of what, what we're dealing with. It, it helps to have friends in high places who, who control the agenda and, and those sorts of things. I mean, I don't know anymore, I mean, I used to know this, whether the, the, the contribution levels of how, how the, the energy folks compare it to other, other sectors, I would suspect it's, it's up there, and it's also heavily disproportionately towards the Republican Party, especially from the fossil, fossil industry. So I want to ask one more question, then we have some audience uh, questions that we'll get to. And, and this is for Arnie. Uh, the market, she's a fickle mistress. Oil was over 100 bucks a barrel. Now it's down in the mid-50s and was in the 40s. Turn the market upside down. Natural gas is in abundance in this country. We're actually building LNG facilities, which is liquid natural gas, to export to places that some of our Asian visitors at this conference will be depending on China, South Korea, and various other countries. So right now, on a price point, it makes sense to change for environmental reasons, 
from coal to natural gas for electric generation. But fracking is what it appears to be, but what, when you consider depletion rates, which are very aggressive on these wells, what if we start really depleting the natural gas, prices start going up, the market now has shifted for transportation to some degree, for electric generation, natural gas prices start going up. What do you say? Uh, no, there's regulations that say you can't use coal again when you're a facility, or a country that economically depends on certain resources from an economic standpoint. So a lot of questions, but I pose that to you, Arnie. Well, you know, you're, you're in a, uh, you know, sort of this environmental system in which we, one country, one region can't control it. I mean, you know, OPEC nations decide they can live on $40 a barrel oil and they're going to run it because of their political issues with Russia. I mean, that's something that, you know, we're caught in the crossfire, but we may be a beneficiary, a beneficiary of it. We like $2 a gallon gas at the pump. You know, some of the impact of it is, you know, uh, I just talked with one of my friends who work at Sangel and they've laid off half of their people in the Bakken. You know, they're still pumping, but they've, you know, they've, they've, uh, they, you know, they've, they've reduced their workforce by, by 50%. And, and the energy industry, the traditional energy industry, is good at managing that, the ups and downs, and, and, it's, and it's usually, you know, by reducing human capital in, in, in their operations. You know, this can no longer just be controlled by domestic energy use or consumption or production because of, of you know, the global forces that are involved in the right. global alliances that are, that are formed. And the overriding issue of, uh, you know, the, the chest pumping, uh, you know, uh, uh, energy independence issue that not only we have, but other countries, start, you know, talk the same thing. You go to China, they talk about, you know, trying to build energy independence. You go to Russia, they talk about energy independence. Uh, you know, so it's, it's not just here. So the unpredictability and, the, and one of the benefits is a diversified portfolio of uh, many different types of resources to draw upon because of simply you can't control some of the uncertainty. So I'd like to get to a question if Kristen is out there, please. Kristen uh, Walser, yes. you had written um, a bit of a question. I'd like you to maybe just explain, please, um, the intent of the question, and we'll do our best. So, Kristen, can I please ask then the panel to respond to some of this? Because we've had attempts at a carbon tax. In fact, several years ago, a carbon trading uh, platform was actually set up out of Chicago for the trading of carbon units or, or such. So, uh, please, yeah, whoever would like to address hear what that. Dr. Duffy has to say. But is it Kristen? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, let me let me speak for just a minute to the to the carbon tax question and and make a, a short point about that by in, invoking my, uh, my friend Steve Cohen from Columbia University. Um, if you want to have an ally today in the quest for a carbon tax, um, I'd suggest you consider talking to um, the, the conservative right wing of the Republican Party, the Tea Party, uh, and the Libertarians. Um, I, I'm on a, a board of an organization called the Energy Future Coalition in Washington, D.C., whose meetings are operated under Chatham House rules, so I can't attribute the comments, but I can disclose them. And at our last EFC meeting in D.C., we were visited by senior representatives of the Tea Party uh, and of the Libertarian uh, uh, representatives uh, in Congress. Uh, they are actually, at this point in time, advocating uh, or thinking about ways in which the Congress could adopt a carbon tax. Now, why in the world would the right-wing libertarians in this country want a carbon tax? Well, the answer is that the libertarian, the core libertarian belief, or the core plank in the libertarian platform is that they, the government should exist only for the purpose of protecting property rights. And they have tumbled to the belief that climate change is going to impact property rights. Now, the cost of the game is that they will support a carbon tax as long as two things are true. Number one, the EPA agrees to back way off on the regulation of activities of energy companies in this country. 111D would go away under their formulation. Number two, the tax has to be revenue neutral. So your idea of using that money for good purposes, forget about it. They're going to use the money to reduce corporate taxes. What that points out is that it is a political game. But the, the add-on I want to add from, from my friend Steve Cohen is Steve 
likes to say, where you stand on these issues depends on where you sit. That's an old saying. If you're a philosopher, this is about values. If you're a businessman, it's about complying with some rule. If you're an economist, it's about failed markets. Somehow the markets have failed. If you're a politician, it's about what, Dr. Duffy? It's, I don't know, it's about all of those things. If you're an engineer, it's about developing something or designing something to solve the problem. What we gotta do, I think, is get all these people together in the same room and have them come up with something a little more holistic than we're talking about. Um, but yeah, I would just add briefly to that, 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 that I mean, I, I agree completely with you that, that a, a carbon tax is a fairly simple way of achieving not just climate goals, but also energy goals and, and air quality goals. And, and, and I think it makes perfect sense for that reason. Uh, but again, politically, you know, Tax is a four-letter word for a, a large number uh, of, of politicians and a sizable segment of the public. Uh, although, although again, this is an idea that many folks on the right used to be for before they were against it, before, before folks on the left sort of embraced the idea. I'm sorry, Kristen, I'm, for, the, for the sake of time, I'd like to have <clears throat> Len, please address that question, because we have time for one more question. Truly, my apologies. I don't mean to cut you off here. Well, the, the thing I would point out is that we do have some experience with market-based systems uh, through the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the northeastern states and now the state of California. And uh, the RGGI, as it's called, started out as kind of a weak-kneed version of cap-and-trade because it didn't really set an effect, effective cap. But it has progressed to do that, and the states actually, I don't remember how many, New Jersey backed out, Chris Christie didn't like it, but um, seven or so states have agreed to actually ratchet the cap do down so that it is actually effective, and those states are collecting uh, something on the order of $350 million out of this cap and trade system, which they then have used to reduce utility bills for consumers and invest in energy efficiency. So there are some market mechanisms that can work, and California is ha so far is having a, a, a very similar experience in terms of rev on the revenue side uh, in their cap and trade system, which is now going to progress to going down to oil and gas extraction. So it's not just going to be electricity generation, which it is in the regional greenhouse gas initiative. And then we'll see how that works. So I, there's also room uh, for individual states or coalitions of states to move ahead when we've got an impasse in, in, uh, in Congress. And I, I have always thought a carbon tax would probably be an effective uh, way to go about it. However, I agree with Bob that uh, tax to the American people and the way certain politicians would spin that with people would just be uh, even more difficult than cap and trade, which we couldn't get over the hump in, in uh, for the, in the federal government. So we'll call it a carbon realignment. They, we they, won't tr call they it try a to cap tax. and cap and dividend right. and yeah, you know I, there's I, all I, kinds of different words they use. Support. So one last question and thank you for all uh, coming out tonight. I hope you found this of interest. All right, got to put on my down reading glasses with our CO2 at 400 ppm and rising rapidly. Where is the delicate balance? It appears to me the environment is losing by a wide margin. Where is the level playing ground? Isn't time running out? Well, absolutely, time's running out. Uh, the longer we wait, the harder it's going to be if we're actually going to do something meaningful. And the more we're committed to more warming and more uh, of the consequences of that. So I agree completely that uh, time is of essence, but in, uh, this is a human-caused problem, which means you have to get humans to fix it, unfortunately, unless the environment decides to fix it for us. <laughs> and so we have to struggle with systems of getting people to be more energy efficient, adopt changes in lifestyle, failing that, find ways to support their lifestyle in, in ways that are less uh, emitting. The good news is, is if we do peak soon, and uh, uh, as, a, as a globe now, if we peak soon, we still may be able to make a, a meaningful difference, but our time is definitely running out. Robert? Please. Oh. I, I, 
was going to say, I really don't have much to add to that. I mean, I agree with everything, you know, he said that this is, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a serious problem. Uh, the, the frustration for me is that the political process seems incapable of taking it seriously and, and producing a response, you know, that would be suitable to the problem, the magnitude of the problem. Bad news, good news. Remember the old saying, think globally and act locally? Doesn't work so much here with climate change. That's the bad news. The good news is I'm optimistic. Why am I optimistic? I'm optimistic because our generation didn't make this mess, but we enhanced it and perpetuated it, right? Young people today want different. I talk to so many young people who are so excited and so enthusiastic about doing something to make a difference. The challenge is they have to make a difference individually, they have to make a difference locally, but they have to engage globally as well. There are 45 million people in Saudi Arabia and they all drive around, well the men drive around in cars uh, fueled with gasoline that costs less than a dollar a gallon. Why is that? Is it because production costs are low? No, oil's traded on a global market. A gallon of gasoline should cost the same in Saudi Arabia as it costs in the United States. But it doesn't, because in order to perpetuate their control over the population, the royal family provides low-cost, cheap, almost free transportation fuel and doesn't tax its citizens. That's how you maintain a monarchy. I'm not criticizing the Saudis, I'm just saying that they're just good business people. They understand how to maintain control. How do we address that challenge? How do we address the similar issue in Venezuela and the rest of the oil-producing nations in the world where they give, it, they give this stuff away, so why not use it? I don't know, but I have some optimism because I think the young people uh, who are coming up in the current generation want different. Mr. Sherman? I just find human beings are not very good at linking current actions with future consequences by and large, right? In California, people didn't get truly upset until they couldn't water their lawns anymore. And, you know, all that went down the tube. I like to look at the analogy to, to some extent of what happened with cigarettes and, and uh, you know, cancer. I remember, as we all do, every cigarette company president standing up and saying, cigarettes don't cause cancer. But when enough people died from it, enough relatives of important people or average people started dying, and the government took it seriously and did two things. The warning did something, but also taxes and raising the price and all that. The combination of it made a difference. And, and the same thing's gonna happen, happen here. There's gonna have to be, unfortunately, I believe, some more you know, catastrophic things are gonna have to happen, and more people are gonna have to be affected by it, and some government officials are gonna have to have the guts and courage to stand up and do what Jerry Brown has done in California on a much bigger scale, and bite the bullet, and take the heat, and make the changes that are necessary, and uh, the, the population will go along, and they'll see that, that it's gonna work, and things will move in a progressive way. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank our panel for their time and their thoughts and their views. So uh, thank you very much.